welcome to SOAS, virtual SOAS at the moment. Uh, my name is Casper Melville. I am a senior lecturer in the School of Arts and I convene the MA programme Global Creative and Cultural Industries. And so the talk I'm going to give you today is just a kind of, as advertised, a taster, just a little, it'll be a kind of an excerpt from a, a slightly longer lecture that I, that I give on one of the classes, which is a compulsory class in Global Creative and Cultural Industries, which is called the Music Business. So um, it's composed of a variety of different elements. There's a core course, which is based around the theories of culture and ideas about the economy of the creative economy. And then there's a, a course, which is a, more focused on film called Global Film Industries. And then this is the class, which is called the music business, we'll, where we look at all aspects of the production, consumption, circulation of music. And so one of the issues that is currently very hot in uh, which you'll probably be familiar with, that's one of the reasons I've chosen this, because um, I hope that you're a bit familiar with some of these issues, is about the issue of streaming. So I've called this lecture, in, in, when I give this lecture, the whole lecture in the music business class, I call it the politics of streaming, but here I've called it what's wrong with Spotify, okay? So and that's the kind of few questions that I'm going to um, try and sort of think about and give you some sense of the way in which we think about these kind of things at SOAS and in this particular MA. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Um, please do, uh, you know, if you've got questions, I'd love to answer questions from you. So as uh, Armin said, use the Q&A function. So the first thing to bear in mind, I mean, the context for understanding why streaming has been talked about so much and is so important. Well, there are two contexts. Context one is, I can't tell for sure, who, I don't know you, but based on my research, and when I say my research, I mean asking my current students this year, so I've got 30 students, the vast majority of them stream music. Most of them stream it using their mobile phone, and the vast majority of those people who do stream use Spotify. Uh, it's not surprising because Spotify has got the largest market share, but this is a really significant change, actually. When I started teaching this MA about uh, seven years ago, no one was streaming. Lots of people were file sharing, but no one was streaming. Um, and then very rapidly streaming has taken off. And the context, so that's one set of context. It would very much surprise me if you didn't have a streaming app on your phone, which is, you've got in your hand now or very close by, because nobody likes to have their phone very far away these days. And the other context is, of course, the impact of digitization on the music business, on the on the music industry, the global music industry. And the impact initially of digital was a huge catastrophe for the music business. Uh, it is usually credited to Napster, the file sharing site, which came along in 1999, which enabled using MP3s, which were compressed music files, which are the standard way in which we experience music online. Uh, people were file sharing. They were swapping uh, files of music without paying for them. Right? And this was named by the industry piracy because indeed it was stealing their revenue that might otherwise they would normally have accrued from selling CDs. CD sales collapsed, uh, record stores closed, record companies uh, profits tanked. So as you can see in this quote from um, Dave Hesmanhaus, who's one of the, the theorists I'm gonna be using for this talk, music industry revenues declined 14 years in a row from 2000 to 2014. Um, uh, people who were file sharing were criminalized by record labels trying to rec recoup or stop people from sharing, uh, you know, taken to court, ISPs were closed down, uh, a huge anxiety about the future of record business, lots of people lost their jobs, lots of bands got cut from, from rosters of record labels, uh, it was widely considered to be, a, you know, the, the language is usually the digital storm, the digital tsunami. They've been saved by streaming. That's really the simple point. In the red, you can see what Dave Hesmanhaus said, the recovery of revenues. And in fact, just yesterday, I saw that music business revenues are back to are now at 23, globally, 23.1 billion, which is back to the level before Napster, to the, to the late 1990s at the height of CD sales. And that's almost entirely driven by the increased use of streaming. And this is happening globally. Um, and we'll know that um, some of these companies are American companies, but, um, uh, Spotify is from Sweden, and there are other streaming services in other parts of the world. This graph here just gives you some, uh, just, so it's just a way of picturing how big streaming is. This tells you 
how many what percentage of the people who who use the internet in any given country have used music streaming at the top is mexico 75 percent of the people who are on the internet use music streaming you can see the united states almost half 48 percent um, united kingdom a little bit less 43 percent but still that is a huge huge number comparative to where we were a few years ago and that's what has enabled the music business to recover uh, in many ways okay so what how do streamers streaming services make their money. And I'll talk a bit, it's not just Spotify, but I'm using Spotify as my key example. Generally speaking, there are these two key ways to make money as streamers. One is to sell ads, uh, to offer a service for free, which has got ads or subscription-based services or some kind of hybrid between the two. So using Spotify as an example, you know you can get Spotify for free as long as you submit to listening to ads, you know, which they make extremely annoying and very loud and interrupt your listening in order to try and push you into subscription. But actually there's been a humongous growth of subscription. Uh, it was long wondered by the music industry whether people would actually pay on a regular basis to subscribe to things online. Well, guess what? They will, if you find the right price point. Spotify at the moment in the UK about 9.99, but if you're a student, I think 4.99, there are family bundles, Many of you might share your streaming with your family or your, your friends in some way. People live in the same house. Um, and also, um, it, that is not it, it, what we've seen across the whole creative industries is actually that subscription model. I don't know about you, but I've found myself now having a lot of subscriptions to a lot of things. You know, it's not just uh, Spotify, but it's also, you know, Netflix and Amazon Prime and, you know, maybe it's Disney Plus and BFI. This, it's something that the consumer has now come around to in a very big way. And partly it was Amazon that drove this process because they made it so simple and easy. Once you register your card details, then you never have to think about it again. And it just comes out of your account. And of course, it is very cheap because if you listen to a lot of music, you know, the amount of music, uh, the payment, if you break it down per track is actually very low, much, much lower than were you to go and have to buy a record when we had records or CD or any other material form. Uh, this conforms to what, um, you know, the, mo the model which is very common on the internet called freemium model. You get a certain amount for free. So nearly all subscription services will give you a month for free to get you using it and then try and gradually build you up into a subscription model. Um, uh, uh, the point about uh, streaming, what makes it streaming is that it's, and what makes it different from, ex for example, radio is that it's on demand. You control it. It's user control. You decide what you listen to and when you listen to it. There is a key point about all of these services, which is pretty much all streaming services are not profitable. And it's a very weird thing to get your head around, but they actually, they generate a lot of income and turnover. You know, they generate millions, billions, but they don't make a profit. And if you listen to Spotify, they'll tell you that's partly because they send so much money to the record labels to distribute amongst the musicians. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, they're worth a lot of money on paper or on the stock market. So Spotify has been valued at $53 billion. Uh, the execs obviously pay themselves vast amounts of money. Lots of people work for it and get very well paid. They are the, the people who have invested in Spotify are on paper extremely wealthy. Um, but of course, the shares could always tank, um, but they don't make a profit. And that's true across the board and was true even of, of things like uh, Google in the early days. Certainly Facebook it took Facebook a long time to to uh, develop a revenue model which was sustainable and it was basically advertising. Now, of course, they're one of the world's biggest advertisers. There are a few exceptions to this rule and I've mentioned here Bandcamp, which is a kind of different model. It's not exactly streaming really, it's more about buying material music or digital music, uh, which is actually profitable. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, okay, so who are the main players in the streaming world? Okay, Spotify. It is the world's biggest, 144 million paid subscribers 104 that's you know that's less than half of the total subscribers that's a lot of people apple music apple would came in later into the market they had the huge benefit of course that they had itunes already uh you know embedded in in apple products and apple phones there are around 60 million at the moment uh, youtube has just launched uh its own subscription service youtube as you'll know has been free for a very long time and it does have a streaming service um they've got about 20 million uh, Amazon Unlimited, it's a bit hard to compare them because that one is bundled in with Amazon Prime, uh, which many of you will be Amazon Prime uh, subscribers. Some of you might not even know that you are because Amazon has a sneaky way of subscribing you 
by asking you if you'd rather not pay for postage. And it's not always clear that that's what you're signing up for. There are independent streamers as well. Idagio, which uh, um, specializes in classical music. SoundCloud, which is a kind of producer led. It's much more for, for producers to upload their own music to and then for consumers to, to interrelate with it. Uh, Bandcamp, I mentioned Bandcamp to you. This is more about kind of, it's almost like a virtual shop window for independent record labels. Tidal, which sells itself on the back of having uh, famous people own it like Jay-Z uh, and Kanye West and exclusives and higher quality, uh, how, higher audio quality. But in fact, it's been a bit of a failure. Uh, it is currently owned by Sprint, the American uh, telephone company. Uh, Deezer, the French streamers, which is owned by Orange. So you can see that there are big players here, big corporations backing this because it's extremely you know, potential. I was going to say profitable, but of course it's not profitable, but actually it's generating a lot of revenue for the music business. L revenue, which is replacing lost revenue. Then, of course, in other parts of the world, although Spotify is you know, moving around rapidly, just added 85 new countries to its, to its list. Uh, in India, the largest streamer service is called Geosavan. I think that's how you pronounce it. They've got 100 million active users, not, not subscribers, but active users. And then China is dominated by Tencent Media, 989 million subscribers. Um, sorry, that's not true. Forget that, that's, that's a misspell. It's 89 million subscribers, 900 million users. You can see the potential size of that market and how they were gonna to come to dominate. Streaming in China is slightly different from streaming outside of China. It's much more uh, based around a social media model. Okay, so what are the controversies around streaming? Well, here are three of the key ones. The first one is related to larger questions about digital culture, which is the way in which the platforms predominate massively. It's about concentration of media ownership, really. Here we're talking about Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Alphabet, who own Google. Um, you can include Spotify. They're smaller. Spotify and Netflix are smaller, but they're, they're building. So there are worries about the lack of kind of independent players or the way that the big boys have pushed out the independent players in this market. And what does it mean in particular that nearly all of these are American based and the money's based, you know, even though Spotify originates in Sweden, it's really an American company now. Um, and and it, in some sense, the, the, the dominance, dominance of these platform capitalists could be imagined as an extension of American soft power. Um, I won't go into that argument too much, but there's a way to read that. The second set of anxieties is really around what does it mean to move from buying music, purchasing music, having collections of music that we love and we value and we're fans of and we identify with to the idea that we're really paying just for access to music, that music is more literally a stream that we just every now and then dip our toes in. What will the consequences be for how we value music, for how, for how the role it plays in our lives? So there's been anxieties expressed about that. And then the big anxieties that you might be familiar with, particularly in relation to Spotify, is are, is enough of the money making its, making its way back to the people who actually make the music? What we do know is a lot of the money is making it back to record labels because it's labels that have the relationship with Spotify. And then it depends on the nature of the contract the label has with the musician, how much money that person actually gets. And there is a lot of controversy. You've probably heard about Taylor Swift and um, Tom York and various other um, you know, famous pop stars kind of raising questions about this and being anxious about it. So these anxieties are kind of expressed in, in three claims. The first claim is that this is this new system, let's call this, the person who I'm drawing this from, Dave Hesmanhaus, calls this the new system the, or the new streaming system, right? It is a new fundamental form of the record industry. It's damaging musicians. It's not paying, it's not paying them enough, right? The second is that the new system reproduces unjust systems of industrial power. That's the platform capitalist argument. And that it's now harder for musicians to earn a decent living from recorded music than it used to be. So there are some specific claims going on in this debate around this politics. Let me just give you a sense of who pays what. I mean, it's, you'll hear a lot of, uh, in, in the kind of public realm, there are a lot of, um, of sort of uh, numbers that get thrown around, which are all incredibly small. Uh, in order to sort of illustrate how little a musician makes per stream. Here you can see a list of the different services, the streaming services, and you can read across it to see the average payout per stream for Spotify, for example, is uh, 0 0.0028 of a penny. Okay, sounds pathetically low, 
Number of streams to earn one pound, therefore, is 357. And the number of streams to earn one hour's UK minimum wage, 3,104. And what this all adds up to is a sense that musicians are not getting paid enough for the, all of the effort and creativity and work that they put into making their music. Uh, you can see there's some variation in the different uh, rates that are being paid, but overall and in general, not enough. That's the argument. Um, it really depends on the, the nature of the deal that you that the um, that the label has with the artist. Like I said, if you're a big artist, if you're a Taylor Swift, you're likely to be on some kind of deal like 30 percent. You're, you're uh, with your you know you'll get 30 percent of the revenue, and the label will keep 70 percent because they claim we've invested so much in you know all the marketing and all of the recording and all of that kind of stuff. So that, that, that's why labels say we want to hang on to that. But most, most artists will be much more on more like 20% um, and they get a very tiny proportion. Um, there is anxiety about whether songwriters make any money from this as well. Songwriters only receive about 10% of streaming revenues. And this figure becomes lower as money flows through foreign collection societies. This is to do with the incredibly complex way that copyrights are collected and distributed globally through an overlapping series of national systems. I haven't got time to go into it here. It's m immensely complicated. Um, anyway, according to Tom Gray, now, what has what's happened recently is that these kind of campaigns have sprung up to challenge this model. And Tom Gray is from something called Broken Record, which is one of these campaigns who makes arguments about how this system needs to be changed to better recognize uh, the value of creative people in order to incentivize them to keep making good music and to make sure they can make a living and pay their rent. And this has obviously become even more pertinent under lockdown uh, when they're in when what happened after in uh, with the what went hand in hand with the development of digital streaming was the huge growth in live shows as well, which live shows are a much more reliable way to make income for artists. They can, they can separately negotiate how much money they're going to make from a tour. They can do more tours, bigger tours in order to get more revenue. Uh, and that, that for the last few years has been the biggest way in which artists have made money. And obviously for the past year, that's completely disappeared. And so that's, that's brought this issue into much sharper focus because of course, this has been boom time for streamers boom time for the, dig the digital economy, boom time for capitalists. And we know that, you know, Elon Musk and um, Jeff Bezos have made, I saw the figure yesterday. I mean, I think Jeff Bezos has made $85 billion in the last year. Um, and that's a lot of money. I don't need to explain how. Uh, here's a couple of things that Spotify does that have raised some concerns. One of them is that they use these tricks to help get people market to market them. So you may be familiar with this called Spotify Wrapped. At the end of the year, if you're a Spotify user, they send you this kind of clever little campaign which talks to you, which tells you how many new genres you discovered that year, what your favorite track was. It's the kind of thing that people would like to share online. And what it amounts to, according to Liz Pelly, who is a great journalist and kind of um, critic of, of Spotify, is a really, really effective marketing campaign where you are the marketer and this this feeds into larger anxieties about the digital culture which is all about the exploitation of free labor and who are these free laborers they're you because you feed the algorithm your behavior is what trains the ai in order to make it more effective in delivering back to you and other people the things that they think you want so i've laid out the, the issues and i've given you some ways in which to understand them. But now I'm going to throw a note of caution at you. And this is something that this is kind of indicative of the kind of critical thinking we like to do at SOAS, which is just to say, hold on a second. And this is what, again, I'm using this article from Dave Hesman Hausch, which it was called, uh, you know, is streaming good for musicians? And he is slightly critical of some of the way these arguments happen. And the reason I wanted to show this to you is because I, I thought that maybe you, you were aware of some of those arguments, you know, streaming isn't paying enough, streaming is destroying music, or it's not very fair. And Dave Hesman House basically says, the jury's out on that. We don't have enough evidence. One of the problems is all of this is hidden behind um, very secretive companies, non-disclosure agreements and things like that. But actually there isn't very good evidence, point one. Point two, the argument that streaming is killing the music business imagines that there was some perfect time before streaming when everything was great. And of course, that wasn't the case. Music, the music industry has always been very exploitative, very unfair, very top down and hierarchical with certain, uh, you know, capitalist entities dominating the system. And 
it's actually always been quite difficult to make a living as a musician. So in all these ways, uh, Hesman House wants to kind of, what he's really, he's, his article is not defending Spotify, but he's calling for much better and clearer evidence in order to understand what's really going on and th to stop the kind of hyperbole, which is suggesting that it's all, it's all down to streaming. Streaming's destroyed the perfect music system, right? One very specific issue is about the way in which um, Spotify distributes the money. There's a lot of talk about, as you saw from that chart I gave you before, you know, how much do you get per stream, right? But in fact, that's not how Spotify pays out. They do not pay out a certain amount of money every time someone clips on a button to stream a particular track. That's not how it's, they use what's called the pro rata system which basically divides up the revenue that they make over a given period by the proportion of who listened to what during that period. And the result of that is that you can, the potential for huge distortion. And one of the distortions is when you're clicking on an artist on Spotify because you want to listen to their record, your, your, their, their song, you're not necessarily putting any money in their pocket at all because it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. And in fact, what might well happen that over a period of a month, uh, because of the, rev the revenue that you put into the system and everyone else is totted up and then divided up according to who gets the most streams, your money is always going into the pocket of Taylor Swift, of Justin Timberlake, of the big, huge, successful artists as much as it's going to the independent artists. So there does seem to be something very unfair about that, that system. And we need to clarify the language in which we use to speak about these things. There is a recommendation on the table from Broken Record. Um, conveniently for this debate, there was a, a, a government, um, not a government, a parliamentary committee looking into this very issue a couple of weeks ago. And they gathered together a lot of people to give testimony, uh, including people who run record companies, people who are in the streaming services and musicians and Broken Record, uh, where they, um, where they, um, <laughs> made a proposal or one of the proposals that is being made about these kinds of things is that they need to change that system that there's something in you know at heart unfair about the system isn't it wouldn't it be better these people argue if there was some more direct relationship between the song i decide to listen to even if it's from a very you know minority artist who doesn't get a lot of streams that the proportion of my the money i've given spotify should go to that entity and not be split amongst all of the uh, people who are streamed during that defined period. That's called user-centric uh, payments and I'm going to talk to you in a second about how some people have jumped on that and very effectively. So the, the, the larger point I suppose I should try and say to you is that there are a variety of different debates at play about streaming which are happening right now. Uh, academics are trying to be involved, academic publishing is very slow so um, it's hard for them to be you know, as up to date as needed to discuss these kind of things, but certain uh, really good academics like Dave Hesman House, who is working in the creative industries world, and there are many others, uh, publish rapidly and call for clear evidence and actually get involved. I mean, he actually gave evidence to the um, to the uh, the inquiry that was going on at Parliament and is involved in the process as well. So. I think it's quite possible that the, uh, there will be, it's possible there will be a change in, in, from the pro rata model of the way that Spotify pays for streams uh, to something else, something which is more directly connected to the art, uh, between the user and the artist. And in fact, just last week, one of Spotify's um, rivals, you might say, although they do something slightly different, SoundCloud. So I don't know if you know SoundCloud, but you probably you do. People of your your generation seem to know these kind of things. So SoundCloud is much more about or has been used in the past for independent artists who might not even have record labels to up, upload their own music um, for fans to comment on that music to share it. They almost went bust last year. It wasn't clear what their business model was. What would people pay for? But now they have they've taken the opportunity just last week to launch this thing that they are calling fan powered royalties. And they are precisely adapting this model, which has been suggested by Broken Record and others that Spotify should follow, which is that there's a much more direct relationship between, um, between uh, streaming revenue and what you've actually listened to. Fan powered royalties are a more equitable and transparent way for independent artists who monetize directly with SoundCloud to get paid. The more fans listen to SoundCloud, 
and listen to your music, the more you get paid. Kind of makes sense. And the fact that they can express it so crisply and clearly, I think, shows that it does, it does seem to uh, make sense. This is what the chief executive said. As the only direct-to-consumer music streaming platform and next-generation artist services company, blah, 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 the, la the launch of fan-powered royalties represents a significant move in SoundCloud's strategic direction to elevate growth. If you fill it out the marketing speak, what he's basically saying is, we've jumped on this idea first, and we're hoping that we can steal the clothes of Spotify and some of our other bigger rivals with our different model and find something that people really want. Because it turns out that one of the reasons I think Spotify will change is that people, you and I and many others who do stream, we can see the unfairness in not rewarding our, the artists we play with the money that we pay. And that has quite a strong resonance with us. So it might well be that we're looking at a shift that's happening right before our eyes in a way. <laughs> Just to sort of pull back a little bit, uh, this is an art from an article written by uh, a journalist called, um, oh, sorry, I flipped on, uh, a, a, not a journalist, sorry, a musician whose name is uh, Damon Krakowski, who's in a band called Galaxy 500. And he wrote an article for a music magazine in my teaching, because I'm trying to teach about um, some contemporary things where there isn't always a great deal of academic work, I tend to combine academic work with, you know, high quality journalism. There's a lot of great digital music journalism around uh, from, you know, reputable sources, which can be put together. Often academia and the theoretical ideas provide the background, because some of these debates are not new. They might be in a new form around streaming or whatever, but they all come back down to questions of justice, to questions of value, to questions of, you know, what does culture mean in our lives and how should it be funded and how should it be protected? Those are some of the core questions of this whole MA. So his suggestions are this, go local. Big is not always best. He's making a, a plea there to artists, particularly to not play the big stadiums, but to play smaller venues, support local systems. Recognize even if you're not making a great deal of money, you're building fan loyalty. Consider what you're doing when you're streaming. He, just, he doesn't say don't stream, but just consider what you're doing. Um, be aware that you're not putting money directly into people's pockets, so find other ways to do it. Care about the context. What, you know, find out more about the band. Spotify doesn't really provide a lot of contextual information. For example, I mean, I'm a big jazz fan. When I go onto Spotify, I can't find out crucial information I want to know about an album. Which, who's playing the drums? Who produced it? What session is it from? This is really critical information for, for me as a consumer. I can find that out because we have the internet, you know, we go via Google, obviously, onto the internet and go and find it out and value it and care about it. Because otherwise we potentially will lose that deep context, which is an important part of the musical ecosystem. Imagine other options, he says, you know, there are other ways of doing these things. And he suggests to everyone that we should share music as much as possible, including musicians. And he tells a story. He says he has a Bandcamp page, right? So if you're a small label, you can set up a Bandcamp page. And he sells the same record on two different pages. And on one of the pages, he sets the price of the CD or the down, digital download, let's say it's $5. On the other page, he sets no price for it. And he says, well, this can be free if you want or pay what you think it's worth. And he says, I always make more money off the second page, which tells you something interesting about the psychology of cons consumption on the internet, a different kind of psychology. People are willing to pay if they feel their money is going to a good cause, but they don't want to be taken for granted or taken, you know, or exploited. So those are just some of the questions. And I think I'll leave it with this very last question, which I think is the most pertinent question at the moment about digital technologies. You might have heard about NFTs, the non-fungible tokens, these, this digital art very poor digital art in my view, but that's just my view, uh, which is being sold for six or 68 million because they're unique, right? And, they're, and the information is embedded in what's called blockchain. I haven't got time to explain that to you, but it's a new way of embedding information, which guarantees its authenticity. So it's kind of like an authentic artwork like the Mona Lisa, but it only exists in digital space. It's a bit like Bitcoin in that regard. It's a bit like art as cryptocurrency, but there's only one of them. So what I'm going to say about streaming also applies to NFTs. And that is drawing from um, Kyle Devine, who's a professor at, uh, in o at Oslo, who studies these kind of things. There's a widespread notion that digitized music is dematerialized, right? It just exists in the ether. Think of all the metaphors, the stream, the cloud, wireless. We're not connected, you know. Somehow it's just, it's all disappeared poof, in a puff of smoke, right? It has no impact, but that's absolutely not true. There is a huge 
environmental impact of digital storage. And we're starting to see this to, to sustain streaming, for streaming to grow, for cryptocurrencies and NFTs to grow, we get bigger and bigger data farms, which are often put in the global south. They are extremely expensive of resources. They use uh, fossil fuels often. They're not environmentally sustainable. They're putting a huge weight. We are building a system where the more people are buying into it, this digital space online, the more they're putting a huge and unsustainable burden on the environment. And we really should think much more about that, according to Carl Devine, and in fact, according to me as well. So that's just a picture of, I'm gonna stop sharing now. That's just like a sort of rapid tour around some of the issues. I mean, not everything I teach is about digital. Uh, I put issues around digital technology in the context of earlier debates about technology, whether it was Bob Dylan playing the electric guitar, or whether it's the use of synthesizers in certain kinds of traditional forms of African music. There's always been debates about technology. We teach something about that. I teach something about that. I teach issues of value um, and what the what art, the arts and culture mean to us and what we prepare to pay for it, who funds it. So it's really about looking at all of those kinds of questions and also thinking about at other times the actual experience of working within the creative economy and whatever, whether we're talking about curator in art galleries, you know, marketing for Spotify, being an artist yourself and how you market yourself and what the kind of ethics of it are. To sum it all up, I'd suggest that probably the way to think about it is we want to help people understand what, how we can work within capitalism because as anti-capitalist as we might be, or maybe you're not, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. We're all living within it. Everything I've just described to you is inherently part of contemporary capitalism. But how can we do it as ethically as possible? How can we do it in a way that represents our own values and the values that we want to promote and is sustainable? So those are the kinds of questions and also what's interesting about it and what's dynamic and what are the new ideas and how do they relate to ideas which have already been talked about in other disciplines in sociology, political economy, cultural studies, arts and literature. So that's it. That kind of brings me to the end of my portion. Um, I can make the PowerPoint available if, I don't know, I'm an, one of the questions is, is the PowerPoint available? I mean, if, would there be a place to put it online? Uh, yeah, we can have a look to see if that's enough survival. Maybe share a Dropbox link. Um, and um, what I'll do is if you want a copy of the PowerPoint, if you drop me an email, uh, so I can be reached at AP79. I'll put that in the chat for you um, at soas.ac.uk, and I'll make sure that you receive a copy of the presentation. So that's there. Okay, so I'm here. We're, you know, I'm here for any questions that anyone might have. Uh, feel free to ask anything about anything. It doesn't have to be about what I was speaking about, about the MA, about SOAS, yeah. about anything. Okay. So we'll give it a couple of minutes. Give it a couple of minutes to receive some questions uh, if we don't get any of them. Okay. Uh, well, well, just wait. <laughs> Listen to some music. <laughs> Bet you stream, don't you, Alan? Ooh, after that, I'm a bit reluctant to admit to it. <laughs> <laughs> no, come on, I do as well. I mean, I think it's worth saying, you know, that um, streaming is amazing. And, you know, Spotify is amazing. I mean, yeah, I, I do use Spotify, and uh, I, for one, found that presentation really interesting. I mean, I might be biased. <laughs> oh, well, thank but, you. Thank you. So, yeah. I mean, I but, think one of the things that never happened I mean, i'm quite old as people can probably tell but one of the things when i was young the idea that i can hear of you know i'll be on twitter and someone will say oh this tune's great and within you know a minute i can not only listen to it on spotify i can add it to my own playlist i can share it myself you know i can immediately add this has never happened before in the history of of, of music consumption the, sure. and the amount of things we can access i do think potentially that comes with some issues because plenty isn't always what's best right? Mm -hmm. Maybe there's something about scarcity or something about the work that you need to put in to discover things which might make us value them more. I, you know, that's a question that I'm interested in thinking about. So, sorry to interrupt. There are, there's a raised hand in the, in the attendees. We're unable to unmute and allow uh, speakers to speak. So ah, the question has just come through. Lovely. The question is, what do you think about Bandcamp? Uh, yeah. Can it be more popular in the near future? 
Yeah, thank you for asking that. I mean, Bandcamp is a very interesting example. I, as for my class this year, I actually interviewed someone at Bandcamp because I have a good friend who is now the head of editorial at Bandcamp. I mean, he's got an amazing job there. He's a DJ. So I, I interviewed him to try and find out if they indeed are what they appear to be, which is kind of like the good guys of, of Silicon Valley, right? They are a private company. They are owned by an individual, but they very much take a different approach they're not data mining they they guarantee they will not use your data for anything you know most of these other big companies a big part of their revenue potential is that they can use the data that they get from you in marketing and sell it to other people they say they'll never do that and what they really want to do is empower small labels to have access to new audiences so there's that plus of course the band camp fridays that they've been doing throughout um the lockdown and particularly in support of Black Lives Matter, which has really made them appear to be, you know, really the good guys. I do think that they are a very interesting model. I buy, I mean, what I tend to do in terms of trying to be ethical in my music consumption is I discover things on Spotify and I buy them on Bandcamp. And I absolutely love the idea that when I'm buying something on Bandcamp, I know exactly how much money Bandcamp take 15% of every transaction and that's it. So all the other money, and on Bandcamp Fridays, they take 0%. All of the other money is going into that small label. And I think that, that it has created the possibility of, of small labels really finding a, a revenue model because they're no longer confined with any, in any national uh, environment. They don't have to open a record store where they have to pay very high rents. They can sell merchandise. They can communicate with their audience. So I, I tend to... I mean, not just because my friend works there, but I tend to think that they, they are a really interesting and great model. Uh, it's, they have a streaming component because you can, they, they do have an app and you can stream, but it doesn't have the flexibility. I mean, I really like playlists on Spotify, for example. They don't have that kind of capacity. So I, th I, I, you know, I think they're a very interesting model. I, I'm very interested to see what SoundCloud is going to come up with, because again, that is very user focused and small producer you don't even have to have a rec you know for Bandcamp you have to be a label to get onto Bandcamp but bank uh, on SoundCloud you can be anyone anyone can have a SoundCloud account and upload a tune they made on the laptop you know in the morning they can upload it in the afternoon and that's a really interesting way to, to both to sort of hear musicians working out their ideas and sort of building their careers without having to go via a big label this was always the big offer of the digital space we could leave the labels aside so I think it's a very interesting moment. It's all moving very rapidly. Um, and I think we should always be very aware. I mean, it's always possible that the person who owns Bandcamp could decide, right, we're going to do advertising or I'm going to sell it to someone else. And it's actually really interesting. I would imagine that he's had, because he's now a very wealthy man, he will have had so many offers because the traditional way it works in the digital space is a small company comes along with a great idea, builds their business. And at a certain moment, the big boys come in and just eat them up and make their, make their owner a billionaire and then swallow it into their larger system, whether it's Snapchat or Instagram or any, you know, any of these great ideas. So it's, it's a vulnerable moment. And of course, it's still digital. So it's still those same issues around sustainability, use of fossil fuel, you know, those still apply. And we still interact with them. I don't know about you guys, but I'm hoping for a way to, do, to, to interact, which isn't screen based. <laughs> I'm just so sick of the screen. I mean, it's lovely to talk to you here, but, you know, I remember being offered in the future, you know, at least a hologram interface, right, rather than just this flat screen. But at the moment, no, it just seems to be more and more and more screen. So we're all moving from our work life, which is screen. And then we do, when we do our downtime, what do we do? Load up Netflix, right, or scroll through, you know, our social media. So we're getting trapped a little bit, I think, in, in a digital space. And we kind of need to think about, especially when we do unlock how are we going to bring some of this into the outside i mean i buy vinyl on Bandcamp, so there's an interesting relationship between kind of the analog and the digital there thanks for your question there's another one there I think. yeah one more's come through uh does streaming pay more than physical concerts why should a musician go for streaming because from your lecture, streaming basically cannot be of help to upcoming musicians, but only to world-class musicians. Even though what the streaming platform pays uh, is still low, it seems exploitative. Yeah, that's a very good question. Firstly, physical concerts play much more because, well, I mean, it depends partly how many people, you know, are you a successful band? <clears throat> but even if you're not, the fact is you, can, you get cash 
or you get kind of money that comes straight to you without any complexity. There may be some middlemen like Live Nation, whoever sells the ticket, but potentially the artist gets a hell of a lot more from that. I mean, the artist doesn't even need the label for a, for a tour. You just, you, you hire a tour manager, you can go out on tour as long as you've got someone to book it. So potentially live, very, very important for revenue. So last couple of years, by far the big bands and the small bands were making much more from that than they were from streaming, but obviously not this year. Secondly, streaming is pretty useless for small bands. You know, it just isn't, it's almost no point. I mean, the point is you want to be on there because you want to grab whatever minuscule revenue you can get your hands on. So you put things out onto the streaming sites. But if you're streaming in the kind of thousands, you're making, I mean, there's lots of funny stories of musicians getting checks for like 75p and stuff like that. You know, you're just not making anything and you're not going to survive. So while the narrative on the one hand is streaming has saved the music industry, streaming is not saving musicians below a certain level. So you're absolutely right. It is exploitative. Um, and one question to ask is, well, what, does, what are Spotify and some of these other companies who are making vast sums and the labels going to do to stimulate the growth of small um, parts of the music economy, which might then feed, become big. I mean, you know, the, these big artists weren't always big. They started off small. So how are they feeding back into it? Thank you for that question. And for Ina's question, so I teach, um, the classes I teach at SOAS are, I convene the MA in Global Creative and Cultural Industries. I, I teach the actual, uh, the core course in term one, which is called analytical approaches, which is a kind of theoretical overview. I teach the music business. I teach a podcasting class where we make group podcasts together with a professional podcaster. Um, I also teach a class, uh, an undergraduate class called art, cultural and commodification, which is around similar set of issues for undergraduates. And I do some guest lecturing on media courses, sometimes on film classes, and I convene kind of seminars uh, just for kind of discussion of all kinds of things. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. Great, uh, Jeffrey's put, I believe your bio in the chat in the oh, reply box, so you can have a look at well stocked Global Teachers. Okay, I think that's it for all the questions. Uh, so right. I guess all that's left to say thank you to you, Casper, for the really interesting talk. And thank you for, to Jeffrey for helping us out today. And thank you to the attendees for uh, coming in to watch. Um, on that, on my profile page, you can find my email address. If you've got any questions about the MA, drop me an email, cm54 at soas.ac.uk, and I'll answer your questions. And maybe I look forward to seeing some of you at SOAS.